Friends, it is good to be with you again. I uh, bring you re- greetings from the Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. We're looking forward to the Nine Marks Conference tomorrow. If you haven't made plans to come, do think about spending your day with us. We're going to be right here. We're going to have a number of addresses going through Marks of a Healthy Church and then panel discussions with all the speakers up here uh, after each message. Uh, we're also having an intern discussion. So guys from CHBC, you want to stand for a moment? Our CHBC uh, interns have come, and um, they are uh, every week, guys, you can be seated. Every week we have a discussion for three hours. They've written papers on things that they've read. I've read all the papers. I lead them through a discussion, not trying to trap them or cause them to fall verbally or confuse them in any way, uh, just trying to help them and edify them sometimes in an entertaining fashion uh, as they interact with each other over material they've read and sometimes disagree about. Anyway, those are our conversations. We're going to do that this afternoon here on your own campus, Lord willing, over in Ledford on the second floor. So if you're either a pastor or interested in being a pastor and uh, have thought about our internship program, feel free to talk to me or one of the interns afterwards about just coming and sitting in on that. You'd be, you'd be welcome to. We've often had a, a few students with us. Now, I'm just curious. So uh, everybody stand up, okay? Just Let me just see who I'm talking to here for a minute. Um, and if you, if you came from CHBC, please be seated. And uh, if you're the president of the institution, please be seated. <laughs> All right, and if you work for the institution, that's your main deal, please be seated. A lot of workers for the institution. You guys were made to come here. Um, okay, if you are uh, an MDiv student or a doctoral student, please be seated. Oh, a lot of you guys. Oh, I'm pleased with that. If you're an undergrad student, please be seated. Thank you for being here. If you are just visiting on campus today, please be seated. Now, I don't understand the categories that I've left. <laughs> Brother, what's your name? Wes. Wes? Yep. Which c- category are you in? So I'm going to be singing this morning, but I'm here because I just need to be Okay. So, yeah, you're right. You're not an employee, but you are a visitor. Okay, everybody else, please be seated. <laughs> All right. So good to have you all. Open your Bibles, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Listen, I wanted to bring a very simple, straightforward message because I think there's a very common error today you find both when you're talking to non-Christian friends, but also, frankly, even among a lot of people just in church who are being a little confused in thinking that all religion is basically the same. Now, any mature Christian understands that's not the case. So probably the kind of person who turns up at 10.30 in the morning to a chapel or the seminary, okay, this may not be your main problem. But my guess is you're talking to people every week for whom when you refer to Christianity, they just just hear kind of like, you know, Charlie Brown's teacher, wah, 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 and they're just, they're hearing just religion, just some general, it's force for good, positive thinking, some kind of positive force. And I think that a very simple verse here in Romans 10, verse 4, uh, can help us really just take that apart. I hope in a simple way you can just carry away with some handles and you'll find useful in your daily conversations. Let me just pray the Lord bless the reading of his word. Lord God, we thank you for every opportunity you give us to study your word. Make us good students now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's the ESV, the NIV, very similar. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So you're familiar with Romans. The first eight chapters, it's God's great plan for salvation in Christ. And then in chapter 9, Paul turned to the question of why more of his own people, the Jews, hadn't believed in Jesus as the Messiah. Why why hadn't the nation turned in mass to recognize Jesus? So in chapter 9, the first 29 verses, Paul looks at an answer uh, from the side of God, and he speaks of God's sovereign choice. But then you look there in chapter 9, verse 30, he turns, and of course, CHBC friends, we missed the study of this last night at Bible study. But there it is. Bobby Jameson's leading us through Romans 9 right now in our Wednesday night studies. In 9.30, he looks at the same question, but now 
he begins to consider the question from the perspective of, of human responsibility. So you look at our verse again in the context, the verses around it. Let me start there with 9.30 and read through 10.4. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Three simple questions. And I think the religion that you see being taught may surprise you. Even more than surprising you, though, I think with this group, I trust it will see, seem obviously true and, and wonderful. Three simple questions. Number one, what is right? Number two, who is Jesus? And number three, how can I be saved? Three very simple questions. Number one, what is right? Number two, who is Jesus? Number three, how can I be saved? So what is right? How can you tell what we, you should do? How, how should we live? Is there a basis for ethics, for morality, for religion? What is it? Well, our verse really presupposes the Bible's answer to this, but it's so far from what many are thinking today that I think we need to begin here in order to understand this simple statement in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So what is right? Well, the answer here is God's law. God's law is right. Here's one of the, the shortest statements Paul makes in his whole letter. He shows how faith relates to the law. But first we need to be clear on what law he's referring to. So if you know Romans, back in chapter 2, Paul has said that all people have a witness to God's unchanging character, even those who've never received the clearest revelation of it, the written revelation of it in the, in the Scriptures in the Old Testament, even people without the Bible know something of the truth. The law Paul is referring to here in its most basic and simple form is the law of Moses with all of God's demands and requirements that he made of his people in the Old Testament. Of course, this law reflects God's righteous character that we see witnessed in the starry host above and in the conscience within, but it's in the written law that God's demands for his people are most clearly presented. So this is the revelation that the Jews had received, that they were privileged to have received uniquely. And this is the law that in the verses just before ours, the Jews had been wrongly trying to use to establish their own acceptability and rightness before God. So Moses gives the law, and it seems like many of Paul's fellow countrymen thought that the mere possession of this law as a gift from God meant that they were okay with God and God was okay with them. Because look who, of all the peoples on the earth, he didn't give it to the belong. He gave the law to the Jews. So that must be a mark of favor and that must mean that God's okay with us. So the reasoning went. Now, uh, the Jews were right to take the law of God very seriously, right again in thinking that it had to be kept they were simply wrong in thinking that they could keep it. They were misunderstanding what the law was there to do. The law in the Old Testament was God's gracious revelation of himself to some descendants of Abraham. It was initially just those first several books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And even inside them, you could refer to just certain parts of it, like the Ten Commandments, as the law taken along with the other books of 
history and the writings and the prophets in the Old Testament, we get a picture of what it is that God was requiring of Israel. And what we see taken together is that God's requirements of his people reflected his own always good, always right character. There is nothing wrong with what God required. There is nothing wrong with what God required. Great themes are sounded. Carefulness of life. The supremacy of the worth of God. His separation from us. A respect for authority. The goodness of private property. The importance of caring for the poor and the weak. The stranger. The orphan. The widow. That people are more important than property. That all people are valued. Uh, You can look at other ancient Eastern laws and you'll notice there are some similarities, but so often their laws apply only to the noblemen in the culture. The law of the Old Testament stood out. In God's law, it's for all people and unfaithfulness is detestable whether it's in marriage or in the worship of God. So these and so many other values are shown here. I've just, I've just sort of touched my finger in the, the pool of all the values uh, that you can see in God's Old Testament law. The light of this law shines in two directions at once. Of course, it, it reveals God's own character, something of what he's like, And it reveals our character. It reveals his goodness. And at the same time, it reveals our badness. Or to use the more religious words, his holiness and our sinfulness. So as as we're noticing his goodness, we can't help noticing that we're not so much. It's just a necessary follow-on of really understanding who God is and what he's like. I wonder if you think about this, if you see something of the importance of having God's fixed standard of what is right and wrong, his law, in order to show us right and wrong, good and evil. I think this world is full of evidence that we, by nature, are deeply morally confused, even deluded. By nature, we're more committed to justifying ourselves than we are committed to justifying the truth. We're more concerned to seem right than to be right. Our ability to both condemn the actions of others and yet see our own actions as moral shows us that some kind of distortion is going on. Something's not quite right. I think I remember reading of the shooter we had a few years ago up in Navy Yard in D.C., very close to our church. And we have a number of members who work in the Navy Yard. And the shooter who killed a number of people was quoted afterwards as having said before his shooting that day, quote, it will be better this way, close quote. What kind of deception has to go on in somebody's mind for them to clearly think that they're taking the lives of people they don't even know will be better? That's some serious moral confusion. But then let's not go to a shooter. Let's just go to you and me. In our own lives, What about when somebody confronts us? What do we say? Do we say, thank you, you are exactly right. I mean, sometimes it happens. But sometimes even if we say, oh yeah, thank you, what's really going on in our heads is, you don't have a clue. You don't understand. And sometimes we're not even that polite. Sometimes we just just don't accept it at all and we get upset. Too often we have this tendency to say, 
Well, now there were actually four reasons why I did this. And we justify ourselves. That's our natural instinct. Surely I'm not the only one who has this tendency to self-justification. Well, well, friends, I think justifying ourselves always, just that that's our instinct, shows that something's off morally in us. Because we're not all right. I know we're sometimes right. But almost all of us realize we're not always right. And yet we always have this tendency to justify ourselves. So if what we're immediately armed to do mentally and emotionally is to defend ourselves, it would seem we're innately armed to defend the wrong thing. We should defend God. We should just immediately, knee-jerk, defend His goodness, even over against us and what we do. But have you noticed how, not just unbelievers, but even believers are so quick to think, well, my God would never, or I could never believe in a God who would, to define ourselves over and against God. The God of the Bible has revealed himself in his word, but instead we take as our moral center ourselves, something that's not stable and something that's not always right. We cloak even the most heinous actions in the most self-justifying language. So if you're a new Christian and you've never seriously looked at the Old Testament thinking it's only for experts or 88-year-old Sunday school teachers, let me just give you some good news. The Old Testament is packed with very practical wisdom for you in your life. So even tomorrow... You could sit down and just give time to reading the law or the prophets to see what God values and and what he asks of his people to see how those should be reflected in your work. And Proverbs breaks it up even into just verse long, sentence long, bits of wisdom. Uh, Just read a proverb every day. Have you heard the old practice of take the date? So today is the what, 22nd? Read Proverbs 22. There are 31 books in Proverbs, 31 chapters in Proverbs. Just always read sometime during the day. Just pick up that chapter and read it out loud. We used to do that with our kids when they were little at home. We would take the day's chapter and we would each take turns just going around verse at a time and try to explain the proverb, what it meant, and what the practical importance was for us. But friends, uh, don't ignore your Old Testament. If you do, you're just impoverishing your own spiritual life. Don't, Don't turn a deaf ear to most of God's revelation in his word. It's there for a reason. The Old Testament is the the backdrop. It's the grand stage on which the life and ministry of Jesus Christ is played out. Uh, You're really going to want to know it in order to best understand Jesus. We're not going to understand Jesus as we should without understanding and studying God's law. That's why a good church will be a church that's committed to studying all of God's word, New Testament and old. So one way you can know you're in a bad church is if you only ever study the New Testament. Well, that's not good. Most of the Bible is in the Old Testament. So that should at least mean that some of our study should be going to it. So in our own morning services, we regularly will have things like the Ten Commandments that we'll read out just to remind ourselves of God's law, the summary, or Jesus' summary of the law in Mark 12. We understand ourselves only when we understand that we are law breakers. This is what James reasons in James 2.10. He says, whoever accepts the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And why does he say that's the case? Because of who has said it. James reasons, he who said also said. He doesn't just logically argue the connection of all the laws. The connection is who said them. It's God's law. Breaking the law is immensely personal. You are rejecting God when you reject his law. That's why Martin Lloyd-Jones could say, our main problem is not our particular sins. The main problem of every person born into this world is the problem of his standing before God. 
The problem is our whole selves. We will only seek a savior when we're conscious of our sin. So our congregations must always be clear that we are guilty of breaking all of God's law. That's why Paul concludes in Romans 3.20 that no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin and will only seek a savior when we are, as Paul puts it, conscious of sin. Only sinners need a savior. So you can come together and celebrate a really positive good guy Jesus in your Sunday gatherings, but you won't celebrate the Christian Jesus if you're not celebrating a Savior. And you won't celebrate a Savior if you don't know that you're a sinner. Friends, that's essential knowledge. It's God's law that tells us that we're sinners. Therefore, we need God's law to show us our need to be saved. So next question, further evidence that all religions are not the same. Question number two, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Some religions would say that Jesus is merely a teacher. But this is wholly inadequate. Who is Jesus is a question really related to the question of the law. We might mistake the law as merely something that we are able to obey in order to earn our right standing before God. But friends, when you study the law, you realize that's exactly what the law is not made to do. The law is not made as a ladder to God. All of us naturally treat the law as a ladder to God. And what the law is not is a ladder to God. Just, if you want to take some of the the power of this message, just take those two ideas away with you and think about them afterwards. We all naturally treat the law as a ladder to God. The law is not a ladder to God. Friends, that's the tension in each one of our lives and hearts. We might mistake the law as merely something that we're to obey in order to earn our right standing before God, but that's exactly what the law is not made to do. This is the the failed attempt to establish their own righteousness that Paul just mentioned in verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. No, the very purpose of the law was specially to prepare the nation of Israel for the coming of the one who would obey all the commands and endure all of its penalties and fulfill all of its ceremonies. The holiness the law enjoined seemed dim compared to the brightness of Christ's own holiness. The law was like light at dusk, whereas Christ was like God's holiness at bright noonday in the way he came among them and lived and loved. The law's earthly penalties pale compared to the vivid sufferings of Christ. The sacrifices it required were but the shadow of the true sacrifice that Christ would make. Christ, we read, is the end of the law. And this is true in that Christ fulfills the law as he taught his disciples after his resurrection. He is what the Old Testament scriptures were all about. Read Luke 24 later. So Paul would write to the Christians in Galatia, in Galatians 3.24, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Apart from Christ, the law can't really be understood at all. It would have been a bridge to nowhere, a sign to nothing. Calvin put it like this, the law has been given to lead us by the hand to another righteousness. Indeed, every doctrine of the law, every command, every promise always points to Christ. Friend, the law was meant to exhaust us, not to save us. Turn back to Exodus really quickly, Exodus 34, Exodus 34. Verses 6 and 7. find this really useful. I used this, this is Thursday, I used this two days ago with a group of 10 federal judges I was speaking to because I knew it was Roman Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, and I thought, well, let's go to the Old Testament and let me leave with you what I think is the riddle of the Old Testament. 34, verse 6, the Lord passed before him, Moses, 
and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Friends, how do those two parts go together? How is God merciful like this, but he will by no means clear the guilty? That's what I've called the riddle of the Old Testament. What I said on Tuesday morning was, my Jewish friends, you get to figure out how you think God does that. I'll tell you what we Christians think. We Christians understand that God sent his only son to fully fulfill the law, but then die as a substitute in the place of those who hadn't. For in the place of all of us that would turn from our breaking of God's law and trust in him, believe in him. And God raised him from the dead to show that he had accepted this sacrifice. How can God forgive while at the same time not leaving the guilty unpunished? Only by a substitute. What substitute would have such a perfect life? What substitute's death would be so valued? Only Jesus's. That's, that's why Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount uh, what he did in Matthew 5, 17, where he says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So to those who thought that their great standing with God was because they received the law, Jesus said, nobody will get to heaven that way. Because they thought that they were the most favored on earth, because they had received the law, they thought them the most righteous, particularly those who were the Pharisees. So if they were being told they had to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, then Jesus was saying there's no hope. They're just hopeless. But friends, there was another righteousness to be given, a righteousness from God that God would provide. Christ had personified that love that fulfills the law. Spurgeon says that if every person who ever lived had perfectly obeyed everything in the law, the law would not have been so greatly honored as it was by Christ's singular obedience of it. God has acted to bring glory to himself in this intricate plan of salvation. In his very person, he honors the law by obeying it more than it would be honored if every person who had ever lived obeyed it completely because he is the eternal son of God. But more than even his active obedience is Christ's acceptance of suffering on our behalf. How does the Bible put it in Philippians 2? And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ completed the work that his heavenly father gave him to do so he could call out with his final breath before he gave up his spirit. It is finished in John 19, 30. What was finished? The law and all of its demands and claims against all the fallen sons of Adam who would ever come to rely on Christ as the end of the law. You look here in Romans, back in chapter 8, you see how he begins it there, just at the beginning of thinking about these matters. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by its own flesh, could not do. All those sacrifices being offered in the Old Testament, they were all pointing to this new order to come. We've been studying through Hebrews this year at our church. And they give Hebrews chapter 9, where, Paul, where the writer says in verse 6, Hebrews 9 Verse 6, 
These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet open, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. And the ESV is translated reformation there, not referring to the 16th century Protestant reformation, but referring to what God did in the sending of his own son. That's why Christ was born under the law. That's why he was baptized by John the Baptist as one who needed cleansing to identify with us sinners and to meet all the law's demands. As Peter put it, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. This is the sense in which Christ is the end of the law, not like some abrupt abrogation of it all but rather in the end the law has been completed its task is done what it was made for has happened i love the way again spurgeon described christ's relationship with the law he said the commandment is exceeding broad but the righteousness of christ is as broad as the commandment and goes to the end of it. Christ did not come to make the law milder or to render it possible for our cracked and battered obedience to be accepted as a sort of compromise. The law is not compelled to lower its terms as though it had originally asked too much. It is holy and just and good and ought not to be altered in one jot or tittle, nor can it be. Our Lord gives the law all it requires, not a part, for that would be an admission that it might justly have been content with less at first. The law claims complete obedience without one spot or speck, failure or flaw, and Christ has brought in such a righteousness as that and gives it to his people. Friend, it's possible that you're here in this chapel and you're not a Christian. Maybe you just came along with a friend who said, oh, no, you should really come today, or I'll get you a free coffee afterwards or something like that. Christians are very devious like that finding ways to, to get you to come hear things like this. But friend, if that's you, this is really good news for you. That there is a, a goodness before God that you don't earn, but you can be given as a gift. Ask your Christian friend who brought you about that. Ask them about that gift of goodness. Your, your goodness is too spotty for God's rely on. It's too occasional, too incomplete. So don't insult God by trying to offer your religious worship as if you go to church enough or you're involved in the Young Life Fellowship enough or the Bible study in your neighborhood enough. You're not going to merit before God his salvation. He's not going to have some kind of amnesia that causes him to forget what you've done to him or to others. So come to find the joy there is in this statement, this charter of our spiritual liberty that we can see the end of the law the, the period of israel's exclusive privilege is done with the messiah having now come therefore we are no longer under the law we do good works not in order to be saved but because we are saved we are no longer under its curse the righteousness we are given is better than any we could make reminds me of that time when john bunyan was doubting his own standing before the Lord, and God gave him a vision of looking to heaven and seeing Christ at the right hand of the Father and being told, look, here is your righteousness. Christ is your righteousness. The, those who trust in Christ won't use the law to try to establish their own righteousness, like the people in Romans 10, verse 3, had been doing. The law humbles us, even as it makes demands only Christ can meet. We could almost read this verse, following verse 3, as it does, but Christ is the whole purpose of the law. Friends, what a silly use of the law it is to try to make your own 
righteousness with it, to pick up this law and try to use it as if it's there to help you build your own Ikea directions kind of acceptability with God. That's not what the law is for. The law's purpose is never fulfilled. Its goal is never arrived at. Its claims are never exhausted except by Christ. Christ has fulfilled its commands by his perfect trust of his heavenly father, by his perfect obedience. And he has exhausted its claims for all the laws that we've broken. He's done it by giving his life as a substituting sacrifice for us. The whole design of the law is to lead us to Christ. We can rest this day because Christ is the end of the law. One more question that separates the religion of the Bible from other religions. Question number three. How can I be saved? How can I be saved? This is the question for us because by nature, we're not right in God's eyes. We need a righteousness that exceeds what we have. But the goal of being right with God will not be achieved through our imperfect obedience. Paul's already been so clear about this in this letter. Just read Romans 3.20 or in chapter, chapter 8 earlier. Friends, the, the way of salvation is narrow, but it is glorious. We have to be stripped of our own righteousness, overwhelmed by the knowledge of our own sin, and seek only from Christ a righteousness that we have never merited. We haven't earned it. We haven't deserved it. It's our only hope. Our only hope lies in a gift. Don't misunderstand God's grace to us in Christ. It's not that Christ has changed, it's changed things so that there's no longer any punishment to be expected for sins committed, but rather that that punishment has now fallen on Christ for all of those who will repent and believe in him. God presents his son to us as the object of our faith, our trust, our belief, so we need to believe in his person, Jesus, the incarnate son of God, the God-man, fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man, and we need to believe in his work, his life, his death, his rising. It's only through Christ's perfect obedience and atoning sacrifice, both being done for our salvation, that we're saved. I don't know if you've ever joined a church, but there are many churches around that if you've joined, like in our church, you have affirmed its statement of faith. Now, ours is the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. And it puts this very well. Everyone who's joined our church has said that they believe the Bible teaches about justification, that we believe that the great gospel blessing which Christ secures to such as believe in him is justification. That justification includes the pardon of sin and the promise of eternal life on principles of righteousness, that it is bestowed not in consideration of any works of righteousness which we have done, but solely through faith in the Redeemer's blood, by virtue of which faith his perfect righteousness is freely imputed, that is, accounted to us by God, that it brings us into a state of most blessed peace and favor with God and secures every other blessing needful for time and eternity. So who's this great blessing for? Well, look again at our verse. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. This is for everyone. And within that, a, a specific everyone. Not everyone who unsuccessfully tries to establish their own righteousness. Not everyone who goes to church enough. No, this blessing is for everyone who believes. Back in chapter 3, Paul explained how even in the Old Testament, Abram's belief was counted to him as righteousness, or chapter 4. When I was an undergrad just down the road at Duke, I had a Jewish friend who was asking me a bunch of questions. And I realized, you know, if I just read him Romans out loud, I think this will work. So I literally grabbed my Bible and started reading out loud the book of Romans. And I remember vividly in chapters 3 and 4 how he would ask a question and then Paul would just go right on and answer that question. 
Brothers and sisters, do not mistake how clearly and powerfully this gospel is presented in this letter to the Romans. Uh, So what is this belief, everyone who believes? Well, it's looking away from yourself and to Christ for his righteousness and relying on that alone. It is the belief that answers Christ's call in Luke 9 to take up our cross and follow him. We believe, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5, that Christ's substitution allows us to become the righteousness of God. That is the happy exchange that he effects. Our sin for his righteousness given to us by faith. This is what Spurgeon remarks on when he says you must have Christ's righteousness or be unrighteous. And being unrighteous, you will be unsaved. And being unsaved, you must remain lost forever and ever. Friends, here in Romans 10, verse 4, I love the everyone. There is no one who's beyond the scope of this gospel. If only you will believe. This is the glory of the gospel, that it is a sinner's gospel. Good news of blessings, not for those without sin, but for those who confess sin and forsake it. Friends, if you'll believe in him, you'll have life. And Jesus promised, have it to the full. Is that what you've experienced? I assume most of you sitting here in a chapel like this again on a Thursday morning call yourselves Christian. Are you experiencing a greater joy at work than you've known before? A joy that's unhitched from office politics or struggles even with your health or in your family? Do your family members and friends see the effects of God's freeing grace in your life, in the way you treat them with kindness that they're surprised by? They think, honestly, how could you be so kind to me when I've treated you like I have? Pray that God will help you to take joy in this provided righteousness, in the fellowship that God has given you with him through this righteousness. And share this good news with other people. Tell them about it. Tell them that this relationship with God is there through Jesus Christ. Tell your Jewish friends. It's wonderful news for them. Consider the the sheerness of God's grace to us in this gospel of Jesus Christ, you realize that it's through faith alone in Christ that the promises of God to Abram will find fulfillment. That's the only way that promised blessing will come to all peoples on earth, like God promised Abram back in Genesis 12, 3. It was never through everybody learning Abrahamic practices, Abrahamic religion, or the the law of Moses and fulfilling it, no. It was always that they would become a part of that great multitude envisioned in Revelation 7 that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And what are they doing? Praising Christ as their Savior. How does that happen? Only through faith in Christ. This is how Christianity is different than other religions. Look again here in Romans 10 at verses 3 and 4. Just read those two verses silently. Verses 3 and 4. Other religions will not tell you this. But the truth is, you and I can only be saved if we don't try to establish our own righteousness, but instead submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. I remember back in junior high gym class, I was so bad at baseball that the PE coach, whenever it was my turn, he would always step in as my designated hitter. I wonder if you're feeling like a failure this morning. Feeling like in your life, if people around you knew the truth, you feel like you need a designated hither. If that's true, then you're ready to hear this good news about Jesus Christ. 
every other religion will tell you to stay out there and do your own stuff. Do it the best you can. Christianity will tell you about what Jesus has done and will tell us to trust in him. Let him be the savior of us and for us. Friends, this little verse, Romans 10, 4, contains a great distinctive truth that is confounding to our own pride and yet liberating us to the freedom that there is in relying on Christ and on him alone. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord God, you know those other things that we're tempted to trust in, things that in the light of the day seem just obviously broken and pitiful. God, would you just expose them to us, break our allegiance and our reliance on false things, imperfect things, our own obediences. Give us the gift of faith. Help us to trust in Christ and his righteousness alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.